Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Chuck Alsup, President of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. Thank you. I was going to uh, try and get you fired up here because the, the, the initial plenary session, we were a little bit subdued, so I want you to feel free to get enthusiastic here. We've got a great panel coming, so lots of cheering for them, and uh, we're going to have a great discussion. So, welcome back. Um, before we jump into this next session, uh, let me remind everyone that for the plenaries here in the Maryland Ballroom, you can email questions uh, to the panel, uh, and hopefully we'll have a logo go up that says questions at intelsummit.org. So send them there. Larry's down here. He's going to be getting your questions, and by the miracle of technology, they're going to appear on an iPad with Vince here, okay? And then, uh, Vince, if you didn't get the word, at some point, Larry's going to tell you a last question, okay? <laughs> So, um, it's now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our Defense Intelligence Plenary, Lieutenant General Vincent Stewart, U.S. Marine Corps. Come on, come on. <laughs> Retired. That's the part I was waiting for. <laughs> And uh, Vince is the founder and CEO of Stewart Global Solutions, an international consulting firm. General Stewart retired from the U.S. Marine Corps in uh, April of this year after more than 38 years of service to the nation. So join me in thanking Vince for his service. A career intelligence officer, uh, Vince served as the 20th director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, where he was the first African American, the first Jamaican American, and the first Marine to hold the position of director DIA. Ooh. General Stewart earned master's degrees in national security and strategic studies from the Naval War College. Uh, and a national resource strategy from the National Defense University. Please join me in welcoming former director, good friend of uh, industry, and my friend, Vince Stewart, to the stage. Over to you, Vince. All right. I don't usually let folks waffle on about my career like this, but uh, since this is Chuck's last time, I let him get away with that a little bit. Uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We've got a very distinguished panel here this afternoon. Uh, if you don't know them, you're in the wrong place. So I'm not going to ask them to do an introduction to tell you who they are and where they're from. Uh, we've got Ms. Carrie Bingham, the Deputy Undersecretary for USDI, Susan uh, White, uh, the Deputy at DIA, Jeff Cruz, who is now at Jake, and Trey Whitworth, who's on the Joint Staff J2. The way I want to do this, I'm going to go through a quick uh, uh, round of questions. I want you to have your questions ready for follow-up. What I'll do with the questions is give them a chance to kind of set the stage, talk about what their highest priorities are, what their concerns are, how this industry uh, could help, and, uh, and then maybe on the back end we'll ask the question that I used to get all the time, what keeps you awake at night? So we'll do kind of a table setting uh, set of questions, and then we'll follow up. Uh, and we'll do this kind of... Uh, um, quick pace, fast break basketball. So if, uh, if, if a question is answered and we don't like the answer, we want to follow up, we'll jump right in. I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Bingham. Uh, lots of conversation about human machine teaming, AI machine learning, and its implications for the intelligence community. Uh, you've described Project Maven as the uh, pathfinder for AI and machine learning. Can you give the audience a sense of where we are with uh, Project Maven, Jake, some of the challenges you've seen and some of the ways that we can be uh, uh, helpful as partners. Sure, Vince, great, thank you. Thanks, it's great to be here. Thanks FCA and INSA. Love this event every year and really happy to be here participating. Uh, so Maven, I always love the chance to talk about Maven and artificial intelligence machine learning. 
I always like to preface it by saying I think right now we're at its infancy, we're at the machine learning phase, we'd like to get to AI objectively, but we have still, got, still uh, have quite a ways to go. Um, Maven, it is, it's a pathfinder. When we were here about two years ago, uh, we were on track for within six months of authority to proceed to get an initial minimum viable product capability out to the field. Um, since that time, they have scaled pretty significantly in terms of increasing algorithm performance, scaling geographic locations. My boss was just out in theater uh, a couple weeks ago and got to see it in action. Scaling across different ISR platforms. We're in dozens of legacy platforms now. Uh, and then scaling across different mission areas, not just full motion video, but other areas of Intel. So we're proud of that, but have an, uh, a tremendous uh, uh, amount of work to go. Just a couple of points I'd make on, on what we're, we're learning, because I think the key about being a pathfinder is you learn, uh, and you apply that to broader activities that, that the Jake in particular is undertaking is, one, I'd say get your users involved early. This is, for us, it's been all about fielding, is get that, again, that minimum viable product, which this is agile development in practice, but get that out to the field, work with the users, and build it from there, uh, scale it from there. Um, second thing I'd say is, where we've learned the most has been in what we call the AI pipeline. So writing the algorithms, probably the easiest part. It's the upfront data access, data labeling, which is incredibly manual, um, integrating at the back end into weapon systems, doing all of the accreditation of all these different DOD systems. Um, so those are the big areas where we're learning. And now as we go into this year, you know, we've got almost, almost two years under our belt now. Um, it's out there in, in enough capability that, that we need to now see change. We need to see workflows changing. We need to see efficiencies. We need to see the culture change as a result of bringing AI into the field. So that's really what we're looking for in the next year. Okay, thanks. Uh, Suzanne, much has been said about the building of the analysts of the future. And while the analytic tradecraft will largely remain the same, the analysts of the future will still be inundated by a vast amount and growing amount of data. Um, with all that data that the analysts uh, will have to swim their way through, what's DIA doing to think about uh, big data analytics and where does Mars, a program we all hear about, fit into this analytic uh, framework? Uh, so there is no question that analysts of the future is something that DIA is trying to really hone in on and define more specifically. Clearly, mission number one for us is providing those analytic assessments to all of our customer base, timely, accurate, insightful, comprehensive understanding of the information out there, providing uh, insight and, and ideally understanding the operational environments. But you're right, the data that's available to the analysts to craft those assessments only increases by the minute. Um, not only that, but the operating environments that we have to assess are evolving. Space is a great example of that. So the types of data and the exquisiteness of that data uh, are incre increasingly challenging for our analysts. So you name Mars as certainly top of the list, if you will, of the initiatives that DIA is undertaking to try to help our analysts make sense of all that information and fundamentally deliver more insights. So Mars is step one, and for those in the room who may not be that familiar, it's our effort to really develop and, and expand the data environment in which our analysts live. It, it accesses many more databases in, in kind of one fell swoop, if you will, allows for ingest of additional data sources that we don't currently have in an automated fashion, and ultimately, hopefully, we'll leverage some of the AI technologies as they mature to just allow more rapid and, and creative insights on the part of the analysts. But Mars is not it. Uh, we're doing much more even in the realm of open source intelligence. Now, open source obviously has been around for quite some time, but what DIA is doing new um, is structuring our effort against open source. So even just earlier this year, General Ashley made some decisions to establish more officially a, a career path, if you will, for open source collectors in DIA. We're establishing an open source integration center. We're putting structure around many of the efforts that have existed in pockets throughout our enterprise. And the intent there is really to bring increased discipline um, around the activities uh, that, that many of our analysts and collectors are undertaking now to drive some maturity into that process and ultimately to allow the analysts to leverage open source in a much more official, tradecraft compliant, um, and useful way. Uh, so, so that's number two that I'd highlight. And then finally, I'd highlight JWICS. Um, none of this happens 
none of this is effective without a strong JWIX foundation. Now, JWIX has been around, as most people know, for 25 years, um, and it has to continue to evolve to meet the customer demands, which, again, are only increasing even outside the IC user base. Um, the, the types of things that people are using JWIX for is, are evolving, uh, and JWIX needs to be modernized to keep up with that. Um, so we're undertaking some investments and some approaches to do exactly that. The time is now, given the need uh, to support Mars, to support OSINT, and overall anal analysts of the future efforts. Uh, so JWIX is the top priority for us in that category as well. I'm probably going to come back to JWIX a little bit, just uh, pick through what a future of JWIX might look like. So I'll come back to that. And I'm going to skip Jeff for just a second because uh, Admiral Whitworth and I talked a little bit about the challenges of producing intelligence in a timely manner in this environment. And one of the things is uh, Suzanne was talking about, uh, I, I was thinking about, when was the last time we used a national intelligence estimate? Because that's a pretty static document. It's almost uh, obsolete at point of publication. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges of generating real-time intelligence in an estimative sort of environment, in a spiral sort of... Talk about some of the challenges of developing intelligence in this crazy world we're in. Yes, sir, thanks for that question. So the chairman and the joint staff have made it clear that we need to focus on global integration, which means that we're not gonna become fixated on regional conflict just as a regional conflict. We're going to look at opportunity cost. We're going to look at opportunity as it applies to other adversaries taking advantage. And that creates so many permutations of potential estimates. So to your point, when we draw, let's say, a national intelligence estimate or something that just stays on the shelf as the 2019 edition, when you're trying to get that integrated and that global it presents a problem, how do you go back and fill in variables that contributed to that particular estimate with some real-time urgency and speed. Enter what we were classifying as our joint concept for intelligence operations. And to your point, it's a spiral estimate. It's basically trying to get those Monte Carlos going with multiple variables so that we can rest assured that at least at some juncture, all of the data is being looked at, but we're being queued to at least possibly reassess for a new estimate. So in, in case uh, our industry partners didn't pick up on that, <clears throat> static assessments, the static summaries that drive decision making, it doesn't fit in the modern, very dynamic world. So how does industry help us to build that very uh, dynamic uh, spiral estimate as the world changes, as the variables changes, how do we see those different permutations so that that drives the decision making at the, uh, at the policy and strategic level? So that's, that's an area that uh, just having almost every publication that we uh, put out there as an Intel estimate begins to be obsolete at time of printing. How do we make that more dynamic? That's the requirement. I'm going to leverage Jeff a little bit here. Uh, I've heard lots of questions today and comments about uh, great power competition. Jeff spent two, uh, three years as a J2 at Indo Paycom. So he got to see one of the great powers carry out its strategy. So I'm going to ask Jeff to just kind of help us characterize the challenges you saw on the front end in the Indo Pacific Command, specifically as China walked through its strategy. So I'll give you an extra 30 seconds so you can. <laughs> China uh, in 30 out. seconds yeah. is uh, an easy one for uh, any good Intel officer. Um, so let me add my thanks to everybody who's uh, joining us today. Great conversations, and thank you, sir. Um, so I think I would preference my conversation with China and my time at uh, PACOM turned into PACOM uh, with two quick stories. In uh, 2014 to 2015, I just happened to be running the keg for uh, uh, General Breedlove out at UCOM and working through what was very much a similar problem set. Russia was going through an evolution, had conducted a handful of operations uh, that they wanted to do um, under uh, a certain amount of uh, cover. Uh, and the, the question for us is how do you illuminate that and then how do you convince uh, the rest of your allies and partners or uh, your own 
um, uh, Department of Defense, the threat that, uh, in this case, Russia presented. Um, the second piece is uh, way back when, if you go back 10 years, uh, when I was a student at the um, National War College, we had this very simple piece of China. It was uh, two column by two rows, and it was China continuing to rise, and China unable to maintain that momentum, and then China uh, being friendly to Western powers, or China being an adversary. And uh, really, in, a decade ago, nobody was picking that quadrant. That was uh, China being able to sustain its rise uh, economically, uh, and domestically, and internationally, and militarily. Uh, while um, uh, still presenting a challenge to the uh, international order. So uh, 2016, uh, show up in Indopaycom, uh, which is probably where you wanted me to start this story. And the first uh, piece that I really um, it came to grips with, with all the assessments that we had made uh, a decade previously, uh, China had far surpassed all of those estimations that we had made. Um, we used to rely on a handful of things about China, uh, that we had a quantitative and qualitative and experiential uh, um, um, uh, ability uh, to, to do whatever they needed to do and, and go beyond. We were far more advanced in all of the areas that mattered. Uh, it turns out China had spent five, maybe six, five-year plans methodically over 25 or 30 years systematically addressing all the areas where we had uh, an advantage um, over the years that they could observe. So um, the first piece, my first probably 12 to 18 months at Indopaycom was illuminating and really understanding uh, where China is uh, in that journey that they were on and what kind of a, a threat it, it presented. So great partnerships with the national community. Um, and uh, uh, it, it is remarkable uh, what China was able to do uh, in that period of time. The uh, period um, at the tail end of that first 12 to 18 months was the crafting of the new national defense strategy. So that really paralleled back to how do we convince the rest of the department of what China looks like and what are their uh, goals and objectives going forward. And the piece that I would offer to you is that at the macro level, I consider China uh, an open book. Um, their academics write considerably. Uh, they plan as a nation and they move out uh, in, in a very large way in a very public fashion. So we know their national objectives are to restore or achieve some regional uh, hegemony, to displace the U.S. as a global plower, and to um, change some of the international uh, uh, organizations out there to be more advantageous to China's authoritarian model. So if we know that, it becomes then what we worked on for the second 18 months, which is the hard part, what do you do about it? And so the piece that uh, you know, I would offer uh, to the crowd here is that uh, while we used to rely on China uh, being able to build a lot of stuff, but not being able to train with it, not uh, being joint enough. Uh, they have worked through all of those issues, and they are presenting, as we have seen in their most recent exercise, um, which uh, concluded not that long ago, uh, a very dynamic capability to employ high-end equipment against a, 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 a scenario uh, that um, should uh, cause a variety of their regional partners uh, to take note of, of what they're attempting uh, to do. Uh, I would say China has tried to keep their intentions uh, below the radar scope so it doesn't elicit the uh, kind of response that uh, we would um, uh, normally uh, take. And uh, they were certainly counting on uh, an ability to use uh, ties in the academic business and other communities uh, to, to um, uh, make it challenging for the United States to make some decisions about what we're going to do to address that. So uh, where we sit today, in, in my view, and the challenge for all of us is um, what is it that we can do today? We're in the competition space today. Uh, China would certainly like uh, us to take a little to no action, to focus on the urgent versus the long-term issue. Uh, and uh, I think what I would offer is um, the important piece for us is to understand great power competition and uh, um, uh, do well in that conflict uh, today, posture ourselves uh, so, um, you know, two, four, five, uh, 20 years from now, we don't find ourselves in a position that we don't want. I'll just tee it up that way. Eric, you wanted to add? I, I would love to jump on that. Uh, you know, we do have a new secretary, deputy secretary. Um, the good thing here is they've maintained our department-wide focus on the national defense strategy, so we're not seeing any changes there. Uh, prioritizing China and Russia and modernization. Um, I think Jeff hit it on the head is, we are in this strategic competition uh, phase right now, and you know the department 
We do order of battle well. We do force on force well. We buy aircraft and tanks and ships well. It's that gray zone space that we don't do as well. Um, it's looking at the nexus between economic and national security. Um, you know, I think about China's One Belt, One Road initiative. You know, military planners, they really care about who owns what port, who's operating what ports where. Our logisticians care about who's operating railways. We care about um, uh, uh, resilient communications, uh, telecom networks. So all of these things are happening now, and if we can't effectively uh, be present and counter in that competitive and frankly economic space, um, you're setting yourselves up for not being as successful if and when uh, the balloon goes up. Um, uh, just uh, another thing um, I mentioned there is just uh, um, technology theft as well as, um, you know, we're, and Jeff hit on this too, is we're seeing them in a pretty concerted effort uh, go after specific technologies. In the past, we've been fortunate to be able to maintain that technology and thus military advantage. Um, when you're stealing it now, we're going to see the same technology that we're doing R&D on now. We'll face it five, ten years from now in the battlefield. So that technology advantage is eroding. Uh, and so we're doing a lot more on the security front to address that. Is, is there something that industry can do to help us in securing uh, that technology and uh, managing the supply chain so that China doesn't take advantage of the great R&D that we do? What are the things that we'd like industry to do? If they, I, I'll, I'll put that up as a jump ball. Anybody, Suzanne? Oh, sorry, yeah, so, um, so the supply chain insights, transparency, management is increasingly a concern for us. Um, obviously, we've been focused on it, particularly in the IT space for years. But what we're finding is that's not enough. That's too narrow of a viewpoint. And we've tried to certainly open our aperture and work more closely with our industry partners to understand the entirety of the supply chain coming through the DIA doors in our case. Um, and understanding you know, the tangents that each of those supply chains go into. Um, it's, it's daunting, there's no question about it, but we have to do it. And we're, we're increasingly looking to our vendors to come to us with transparent display, if you will, of, of your supply chain so that we can understand it, so that we can have confidence in it and really make sure that, that everything that comes through the front door is uncompromised throughout, whether it's equipment, you know, it could be cameras, it could be chairs, it could be furniture, it could be IT equipment, it could go on. Um, so we have to think more seriously and work together on the supply chain because understanding it um, takes multiple views of multiple phases of, of supply chain, both in industry and then on the government side too. It's knowing you're a target. Uh, there are multiple uh, methods that the Chinese are using right now to go after our technology and intellectual property. So cyber, you know, cyber means, so uh, clear defense contractors, we know you are our target and we know it's your unclassified information, your subs that are the target, um, basic cyber hygiene, encrypt data at rest, don't connect thumb drives to your mission systems and then the, the internet and you'd be surprised some of those that do that. Um, but the basic cyber hygiene, um, uh, knowing, uh, having strong insider threat programs, um, better controlling your sensitive but unclassified material. Um, so there's a, a whole host of things that you can do. Um, and we are in the department, we're treating security as a mission area, no longer an admin or a back office function that can be traded away. Um, so those are just a couple of the areas to focus on. Sure. Sure, if I could add just a couple of pieces. One is uh, for the first 25 years of my career, I had the luxury of not paying a lot to economic intelligence. And uh, for um, a large part, we relied on various partners or very exquisite niche capabilities within the IC to do some of those pieces for us. Um, uh, the last three years, I've spent more time on economic intelligence and understanding the connections between economics and security issues. And uh, in industry's ability to help us work through those issues is, is certainly welcome. Uh, to um, echo a little bit on the uh, cyber hygiene, um, defending and protecting your networks, uh, but also having the same uh, approach to counterintelligence that, that we are doing. We are scaling up our approach to counterintelligence due to what Ms. Bingen relayed to is China's approach and other people's approach to the various access vectors. The direct access vector to what they want is not necessarily the path they're going to take. Uh, China's global presence and others' global presence gives them a lot of opportunities. Uh, so I, I think for me it is asking industry uh, to be cognizant of your networks, your people, your connections, uh, your vendors, 
uh, all across the globe. And then the last piece is uh, our national strategy really depends on uh, allies and partners. And so anything industry can do to uh, help protect uh, and secure the networks of friends, partners, and allies uh, because of our desire to connect to them at speed and scale with data uh, means we're going to have to rely on the security of their, their networks. And there's a direct application to US national security. So let me, let me echo industry partners a little bit and so you get the reaction. You guys make it so hard for us to bring you the best technology that solves your problems today. You talk about acquisition reform, you talk about acquisition agility, you talk, you built all kinds of structure, uh, universal need statement, joint universal, joint, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, things that fix the symptoms, but doesn't allow industry to bring the best ideas the best capability, the best technology to you today. Where's the department? Where, uh, where are we in really allowing industry to help us and be good partners? Anybody, anybody want to jump on that grenade? Because that's, that's what I hear from industry. You make it really, really hard to help. The first person that told me that was Jake Jacoby when I took over at DIA. He said, I, 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 I've got stuff I can't share with you. Where's the department on acquisition reform, acquisition agility? What, what can we do better? Uh, Gary, I'm I sorry. I could call it, call, was it phone a friend and have Ellen Lord sitting up here? Ellen Lord, yes, I know yes. they're doing a lot there, but uh, you know, I, I can't, uh, I, 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 sorry. There's I, a lot of truth to that. I said, that I, um, I told him no gotcha questions. That may have been a gotcha question. I'm sorry. But. No, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And, and uh, you know, me working with Joe Kernan, who has been not sp spent time at the, at the edge of the spear, but then also spent time in industry. You know, we know there are, there's plenty of talent and ideas out there. Um, we're seeing the services, whether it's, you know, Kessel Run or other activities or uh, vehicles to bring in ideas. With Maven, we, uh, we brought in over 40 different industry event partners from the bigs to some of the, you know, smaller dot-com startups. Um, I'll say, uh, and you know, we need to do a better job practicing what we preach, but when we say agile development, it's, and I get, you know, there's a BAA or something out there for give me something in six months. Give me something in six months. Don't give me a proposal in six months for how you do it. Um, so uh, Maven has been a great example where, you know, we put six months as a bogey out there and we had some, we sprinted and had some pretty phenomenal uh, capabilities from across the spectrum of the bigs to smalls actually deliver algorithms and capability that we are then able to integrate into some command ISR capabilities. But don't bring us a proposal, bring us capability and we'll build it from there. I was going to go with uh, minimal viable product. If you could talk about what that really means, I think you just did. It's like, don't bring me a proposal, don't bring me uh, 18 PowerPoint slides, bring me something that's usable today. Anybody else want to jump on that? I can speak a little bit even to the congressional side of this because even in the context of Mars, what we're finding is still in some cases a level of discomfort on the Hill with all things agile development because it's not well defined by definition. Um, and particularly as they're looking for us to justify resources and investment, uh, they're saying, well, when is it gonna be delivered? When are you gonna be able to use it? When am I gonna see something concrete? And how much is it gonna cost? And we're saying, not sure yet because we're going through agile development and we're gonna test things out, and we're gonna like some, we're not gonna like some, and we're gonna adjust. And some of them are still having a hard time embracing that and supporting that. So, you know, yes, the department has work to do on it for sure, and we all have work to do on, frankly, leveraging some of the flexibilities that do already exist, but we also have to work with Congress on the receiving end, if you will, because they're fundamentally critical, of course, to us actually proceeding. Trey, did you wanna? No, you didn't. Very happy with the USDI's response. Yeah. <laughs> you have one of the, the biggest challenges in terms of warning uh, uh, in the J2, trying to get insights. And I remember many times the uh, US Forces ca uh, Korea commander wanted 72 hours of unambiguous warning. Have you, have you solved the warning problem yet? And uh, if you haven't, what do we need? What are the challenges? And how do we get after solving the warning problem for you? Thanks, sir. There's a lot being written right now about the warning problem, and I think a lot of people are citing that we have a warning problem. They're citing Crimea, they're citing Mosul. Um, at the same time, the question is, do we have a warning problem or do we have an omniscience problem? Do we have a listening problem? Or do we have a data problem? And this kind of gets to a natural segue. What keeps you awake at night? Well, it used to be, and I, 
is Admiral Jacoby here? There he is. All right, sir, I don't know if you remember, 25 years ago, you said, I just want it all. I want it all. I want all the data. And that was, at that time, it seemed like a huge quest, but it was at least a goal we could set. Now I'm more worried about what we're not going to at least even assess. What, we're, what, we're, what hits the cutting room floor? And so that really keeps me awake. On the warning problem, what hits the cutting room floor? So we need an application. We need a series of applications. We need some additional help so that we have the certainty that at least data has gone somewhere and has been processed through, and I'll, I'll just offer, perhaps machine learning, AI, to at least cue us what I was talking about before. New variables, you need to know this. You need to at least consider this. And that's where I would say, that's kind of answer one on what keeps us awake. And, and it is directly tied to warning. The second would be uh, also related, and that is assessing ourselves. And how do we know that we are assessing ourselves? This is actually tied into the joint concept for intelligence operations. It's kind of the second part, which is a spiral estimate of our own readiness. So as we get into this globally integrated world and so many things could go wrong, so many warning problems could be out there, opportunity cost, et cetera, how do we know that we have all systems on go? How do we know that the federation that we've set up is working? How do we know that we've got at least the right number of analysts allocated to different, uh, to different warning problems that might be uh, related? So it's a complex answer to, uh, to uh, what probably seems to people like a very uh, easy question, but. Jeff. Can I add one thing to that? So um, uh, you know, my vignette for warning that was instructive for me uh, was, uh, again, at, at Indopaycom, uh, we had a subordinate of Unified Command at USFK, as everyone knows well. And of all the warning problems that are written, written with precision and tracked by the most number of people to provide the most collaborative results, that is the warning problem. Um, but, you know, quite frankly, there's three major aspects to of it, and one of them is warning of just internal stability for North Korea. So when we just swapped out, and I say just, it's been a little bit, uh, USFK commanders. The USFK commander happened to come through the Indo-PACOM headquarters, did a series of office calls, and my first conversation was this. Sir, what do you need warning of? Because we can't provide you warning of everything. And he rattled off three things uh, which required a major rewrite of the warning problem. Uh, but to me, that's always step one, is understanding what do you want warning of, and then designing the warning problem, and being comfortable if two weeks later, what I want warning of changes. Um, I don't have any questions yet, so either we're, we're having a really great conversation and you guys don't have any questions or we put you to sleep. But that's okay. You got questions coming, you're curating questions. Um, we can't, we can't, we got to talk a little bit about cyberspace operations. Uh, U.S. Cyber Command is coming up on uh, nearly 10 years now from the early days. How are we doing in terms of intel support to cyberspace operations? We thought our way through the right policies. Are we meeting the requirements from the joint staff, from the combatant command? How does DIA organize for uh, support to cyberspace? Or is it just another intel thing that uh, is plugged in in this multi-domain uh, world? Jump ball. I'll take a stab. Uh, having seen it, at least from NSA's perspective, because I was not assigned to Cybercom, but I was a partner. And I think we're actually postured better than people think, mainly because cyber is, an, is a domain that is inherently intelligence-driven. People are in the domain. Intelligence analysts are in the domain when they do that collect and when they actually help an operation to occur. And so to think that it's broken and that there is not sufficient intel support to cyber perhaps reflects some people who aren't entirely familiar with what actually happens inside of an ops room. And that might seem a bit harsh, but it's true. There, it's, it's very hard to describe just how much intelligence is going into a cyber operation without it being inside the ops room. So I'm actually more optimistic than most people on this issue. Okay, anybody else? Suzanne, you want to talk about JWIX a little bit? What's sure. JWIX of the future look like? And what, what do you need to transform? If transforming JWIX is the answer, uh, what does JWIX of the future look like? 
So I wish I had an answer for that. And what we're doing is trying to gauge from the broader community exactly what they think they need from it, because it continues to evolve. As I mentioned earlier, you know, it started as the core IC system, um, and, and it was exactly that for many years. What we've seen over the last five years plus is really an expansion of interest in JWICs as the daily system, I'll say. It's C2 system, the communication system, regardless of classification, and there's multiple reasons for that. It's fundamentally trust in the reliability of the system and the security of the system. Um, it's understanding that, frankly, that's all the information you could need would reside on that system instead of going back and forth between SipperNet and JWICs, which is very useful and efficient to many users. Um, but we're trying to generate more of that conversation of if we were to create JWICs today, what would it look like for the entire community, the IC, the DOD, and even broader federal, um, and how would it would be structured, how would it be managed, we're looking at this as an opportunity to have exactly that conversation because there is such a demand signal. Um, so we're trying to understand that so that we're, as we head down our path of modernization, we're addressing all of those, those concerns and those potential scenarios for where JWICs will go. Um, so more to come on that conversation. Really, the uh, no longer an Intel collaboration environment. It is a command and control. It's a decision support. It's an Intel environment. It is all of the above to all customers at all times. And the real question is, is that the right model? And if it's the right model, what does it mean for us in designing the next version of JWIX 4.0 or whatever the heck it is? But it is certainly evolved from, uh, it's, here's an Intel platform at the highest classification level to every combatant command, every J3, every J5, every has a JWIX box. Mm -hmm. Now, the follow-up then, and you touched on it a little bit, is about partnering. Mm -hmm. What's the partner environment that allows us to collaborate in, in that space? And I, there, there are lots of uh, different versions out there, but something we really need to think our way through. All right. Um, Jeff, you've been, you, did you want to? Oh, no. Sorry. Jeff, you've been in Jake now for how long? And where? Where are you, where are you now? Uh, I work for uh, Mr. Kernan and Ms. Bingen at USDI, so not the Jake. I have not yet at support. the Jake? I thought you were going into the Jake. Uh, okay, maybe, oops. I am, I am glad yeah, I shouldn't that announce that. Another Air Force General. It's, yes. another, it's another Air Force General. <laughs> um, so uh, one, of, one of the great challenges we have to, uh, today is uh, awful lot of data being collected on all of us. Uh, and what do we do to protect our data internal to your organizations, data that's collected on us? Are we doing anything to make sure that uh, that environment is clean for our, uh, our intelligence professionals? And what can industry help us to do to protect our data, if anything? Jump ball. I guess that, that you know there's there's at one level there's the you know we clearly have laws policies regulations there's a lot of DoD directive and instruction on uh, how we protect information um, but then there's the actual you know mechanics of it and the technology of um, I mean heck I've, I've we've got the background investigation uh, mission coming to DoD in less than a month now um, and as we look at rebuilding that IT capability. You know, it's ensuring that it is all of our, everyone that has a clearance um, uh, uh, or a credential that your information is protected. And so it's building all of those cybersecurity elements in up front into the system. Um, so I think that there, there's, there's a technology piece to it as well that we'll continue to need help on. Yeah, here, here's the thing that I want uh, industry partners to think about. Um, all of our data is available out there to any of our adversaries. And even the data that we try to protect is available to our adversaries. Um, we have closed circuit TVs and cameras in every city that's capturing biometric data. What does that mean for us, not only as a society, but for intelligence professionals? How do we protect that data? How do we make sure our adversaries aren't able to use that data? And so how industry can help us to think our way through biometrics, closed circuit TV, uh, all the data that's out there on the dark web, that exposes all of us, but more importantly, some of our very sensitive collectors. 
How can industry help us to solve that problem? That's really where I want to go with that question. And you think about all the super squirrely stuff that we do, our human intelligence, our counterintelligence. Um, you know, the last 15 plus years of CT, it's been very much focused on you know, vetting Taliban or whatnot in Afghanistan. But you know, when you have a sophisticated adversary, a Russia, China, those skills uh, have atrophied quite a bit over the last decade and a half. And so we're, we're working on rebuilding that. But you're not rebuilding it to what you did in the 70s or the 80s. You're rebuilding it in this modern technology environment where there's constant surveillance, smart cities, uh, you're, uh, everything out there on the internet um, that our agencies are having to think through how, how they do that. The human CI cover all those aspects uh, that are core intelligence missions. All right. Um, does DOD see commercial satellites as, as an alternative to national technical needs? I'll say as a, I'll say as a compliment to, to national technical means. Um, you know, you're, you're still going to have your um, your need out there for some pretty exquisite high resolution capability and other features that that those satellites have. Um, you know, maybe some additional protective measures given where the threat has gone in space. Um, that you're, you are willing to pay a premium on. At the same point in time, God, is it an exciting time to be in commercial space right now. Um, I visited uh, one place uh, a couple months ago where they're fine tuning their production line to pu pump out six, seven satellites a day. I mean, that's just, it's unfathomable for someone where it was six, seven years. Um, so there's some really exciting things there. What it's, so we absolutely, from NRO to others, have to take advantage of that. The other piece of it where industry can be, can help us quite a bit is not just on the sensing side, but the TPED side. You go into a ground station today, it is manual, labor intensive. You have people moving around bars on computer screens. When you start getting into the constellations of the sizes that we're talking about, you can't have a person in the loop doing that manually. So all the, the automated tasking, automated um, you know, collection optimization, um, the processing side of it, moving some of those, those algorithms and, and processing even upstream further, um, freeing up your analysts to do other things. There is a, there is a whole manual labor intensive linear set of processes out there that we, we must do better and if we're gonna be dynamic as you were talking about earlier and much more responsive to, to the threat environment we're seeing vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and Russia. Um, yes, lots, yeah, go ahead. I would just Can offer, for, as a former J2 for US AFRICOM, a place where we have some partners that would really appreciate some of that commercial imagery. It has a perfect application there as well. It's for partnering, as we were talking about. Uh, it, it provides them at least with an avenue. If I could add okay. uh, one, probably two vignettes to that as a former J2. Um, the, the commercial imagery um, gains that we have seen over the last handful of years have been absolutely crucial, and it actually helps us get the most out of the uh, national architecture. Um, you know, for example, uh, Indopaycom was 52% of the Earth's surface, a lot of that covered by water. So how do you track open ocean areas? How do I um, track um, uh, North Korean ship-to-ship -ship transfers of illicit uh, oil? Um, a lot of times that was only on a certain periodicity, doing a high resolution image with national technical means and using commercial imagery at every phase in between and being able to stitch those together cohesively in a way um, that gave me the best picture. The best picture I had and could provide my boss was always a combination of, of the various pieces together. And so I think that's really the, the future. How do, we, um, how do we stitch that together? And then back to Ms. Bingham's point on um, the ability to extract um, information out of commercial imagery and making that a readily available uh, tray. And I just happened to be having a conversation earlier today about synthesis. There's a lot of data. How do we take all of that uh, down to those two or three key uh, takeaways that we need to make decisions in a high speed, high, um, uh, you know, priority environment? And uh, the ability to extract data out of commercial imagery, I think, is a, um, an important business line to continue to pursue. So this, this, this one came from the audience, but I was wondering about this earlier. We all talk about machine learning, we talk about artificial intelligence, talk about all the technologies that are coming into the workforce. Is our workforce ready for this? And what are we, what, what are we doing to make our workforce culturally ready for this influx of technology? And, or is it the same workforce? And it might be, be the same workforce, they'll adapt over time. 
any thoughts on what are we doing to prepare our workforce for technology? Sure, from DIA's perspective, I think it's a little bit of both. So some of our existing workforce surely are um, adept already, are hungry for it, are eager to, to continue to um, evolve their, their own capabilities and, and their habits, frankly, on, on how they leverage technology. But that said, there's no question that some of it's going to have to be trained, some of it's going to have to be hired to some extent. Um, and what we're trying to do is really hone in on what does that look like? You know, what, what skills do we have to teach? What skills do we have to seek out and recruit? And defining that um, is, is still part of the, the, the puzzle, if you will, that we're trying to piece together on it. Um, but the workforce, in many respects, you know, we have such a great workforce that they're very adaptable. They're interested in trying new things. They like experimenting. They're, you know, just innately curious. So you, you put a piece of new technology in front of them, um, and they will play with it, and they will figure it out, and they will figure out what it can do for them, and they'll take full advantage of it. Um, so it's just a question of how do we leverage that and how do we encourage that and develop that um, while rounding it out where we still have gaps with, with the hiring and the training. I'd agree with that. We, we have analysts, obviously, who are sourced by DIA. We are DIA, and, and especially a younger crowd are, are looking for advantages all the time. They're always looking for an advantage, so a new application uh, is going to be welcome. I don't think we're going to run into a situation where analysts are going to feel in competition with a machine learning environment. I think they're going to find it completely complementary, and they're not going to actually find it a substitute for their wetware. They're going to find it just, uh, just an addendum, something that cues them to a better product. How do we train them? Because uh, the, the, the training that we do today is probably not the same sort of training and preparation we need for the future analysts or the future workforce in this environment. Is there something we'd like industry to think their way through in terms of how we train, prepare our workforce to be successful in this next era? I want, you, I want you all thinking about virtual training. I want you all thinking about the immersive, increasingly complex training. I want, uh, I, I want to think about uh, how painful it would be to have an instructor standing on a podium lecturing as we prepare our workforce. What's the different training model? Is there a different training model? I can envision a, a, um, a situation where we would put an emphasis on certification to use the tool so that the analyst knows the left-right limits of the product and of the queuing coming out of the tool, and we probably need to ensure that they're uh, witting to knowing when the tool's probably off at this juncture. This is probably, this is based on what could be a bad variable. I need to regroup and try again. We went through this actually a long time ago. Uh, it, you know, with Maven and everything that's happening, we actually looked at the automation of point dropping in the targeting community and there are some tools that made things very quick, but they also cut a few corners in the interest of speed. And so as we thought about it, we said, we want this tool, but at the same time, we want to know where it potentially is dangerous to precision and to accuracy. And that was the basis of certification for using the tool. The tool is actually used. It's not a substitute for the good old-fashioned way of dropping points. It just happens to complement the process. So I could envision analytically a, a very similar environment. You just know what your left-right limits are in terms of tolerances so that you can cue to yourself and to your chain of command that this was based on some machine learning. We might need to take another round. But, you know, it also goes back to just, you know, we need to preserve the, the hard critical thinking skills of our analysts. Um, especially with all these different data sources that are even more readily available at their fingertips. So whether it be those machine learning tools, you know, the traditional imagery or signals intelligence, but even I think publicly available information, we're using that so much more, but you have, you have to be able to discern how reliable, how credible is this, and what kind of decisions are being made off of it. Um, so there's, I think, a, a, just a, an evolution of, I think, the, the trade craft and those critical thinking skills that have to evolve with the technology and all the different data that we're, just, we're getting our hands on. Uh, lots of the services are talking about multi-domain operations. You know, when I started this business, uh, the Army and Air Force did their thing, the Navy and the Marine Corps did their thing. And, then we got to joint after Grenada, and then we started talking about airland battle, and then we started talking about, now we're talking about multi-domain operations. 
what does that mean for the intelligence community, one, and uh, for the J2, the joint staff, now you have multi-domain operations in a globally integrated world. So we talked about China as if it was a regional problem, so it's actually a global problem set. What are the challenges of uh, Intel support to multi-domain operations in a globally integrated environment? Sir, I think I go back to how to assess the opportunity risk as we're getting a, just a bit too fixated on a regional problem. That is not an inherent part of our tradecraft at the moment, and kind of getting back to the training piece, that's something we're gonna have to work on. Let's just imagine, you know, we have training, to, we, we have decision tools for something as simple as moving from point A to point B. In our smartphones, we use either Google Maps, Waze, something like that to help us assess how quickly, what's the best way to move from point A to point B? And you're gonna use different choke points. Uh, just imagine that they are different variables. And you're gonna, we all, everybody's done it in here. You just, you're kind of testing, testing the Monte Carlos, just to make sure it's correct. Now imagine you have an armada of cars trying to do an objective as well. But there are others who are, have an armada of cars and they actually want to confound your solution. Imagine all the permutations of that. That's a, that starts to get very complex when you're thinking about the Monte Carlos for opportunity costs and how an adversary might take advantage of, of your dilemma in a particular place. How does an analyst efficiently, succinctly address that? That's, that is not something that we necessarily train to. I would add there's a data side uh, on the back end of this. Uh, Multi-domain operations would require one service to sense, another service to shoot, and then on behalf of a, a perhaps a third service, uh, sink a ship. Uh, how do we all have that same picture that we can uh, have a common understanding, and that requires an interoperability and a data standard that we have yet to achieve, uh, but, but continue to work on? Um, and then there is the data integrity of the data that flows across there uh, to get after TracePoint. How do you ensure that nobody's putting false data in there so that if you're doing long range over the horizon fires uh, between uh, a shooter who can't see a target and, and the, the sensor that um, you're not causing fires uh, um, to go astray or on your own folks. So uh, there's a, a tech side of multi-domain operations. I think that underpins it. Um, once we work through that piece, then it becomes the TTPs and a trust and confidence in how that uh, would, would work in a globally integrated environment. That's right. And I don't I want to speak for Admiral Kohler in the Navy because I think these things are still going on. But now let me just talk as a naval officer. And I think the jury's still out as to if we're talking about the domain of space or we're talking about the domain of cyberspace and how specialized these, this particular, these domains are, we have to ask ourselves, whether generalization, as we're rearing especially officers, uh, is the right path, or whether we might actually might need to think very seriously about specialization, I was having this conversation with Admiral Jacoby not too long ago. Right now, we tend to reward and seek generalists, and we might need to adjust that in, uh, in cyberspace, going back to your, your question. It's a very specialized craft, might need to keep people at keyboard for a long time, as opposed to back and forth between some of the domains we have within our services. I think the Air Force is already moving in this direction. Suzanne, you were gonna come in. So Mars, the vision for Mars is to enable those multi-domain operations as well. I mean, fundamentally, one of the key efforts under Mars is to understand and, and, and try to pull together in some form or fashion various capabilities that the individual services are gonna be using and leveraging and how they can bring them together with common data and common access to that data and then feeding it back and forth in and out of Mars as needed during an operation too. So that's you know, a fundamental precept of Mars looking forward is, is how exactly to enable that future. Yeah, there's, there's a good amount of plumbing that we still need to do in our community and I'll use you know, DCGS as an example where yes, you can share, it's, it was supposed to be the common ground system and um, we've seen each service has developed its own kind of bespoke capability. So although you can share products, the, data, the, the raw data isn't exactly interoperable. So there's still quite a bit of work we have to do on that interoperability 
um, the, the data standards and formats and architectures that were talked about earlier. But then there's also a trust piece to this as well, is you have to be able to trust that someone else is going to provide data and that, that you can do something with it or that you can act on somebody else's data. I was just thinking the missile defense community, they've, they've had to work through that in the last 10 years or so. I think we need to apply some of that learning to other areas as we think through multi-domain. Uh, talk a little bit about OSINT. Um, creating an open uh, source center. Uh, some thoughts about how that might work. Implications of if you do this, you're going to bump into US persons data. And we thought our way through the policy. And can you just uh, spend some time expanding on open source center? Sure, and, and um, come October is when we're kind of open the doors, so to speak, on, on a more formal center than we've had ever in the past. And it's going to grow over time and evolve over time. So part of it is a structural change for us and, and organizing DIA's activities a little bit more specifically to include dedicating people um, into respective centers or commands who really will be kind of the, the hub of the OSINT activity in that location. But then as you indicate, Part of it is, what is the tradecraft behind it? What are the rules behind it? And, and again, I think because so many of our analysts and collectors have been kind of sort of doing it on their own for many years, you know, the, the imperative is clear that we have to bring some discipline to this, particularly when it comes to US persons, to make sure that everybody's doing it appropriately and accurately, um, and, and from an oversight perspective that we can uh, stand by it. Um, it's, it's a significant change for a number of reasons for us, um, but it's going to be a, you know, an evolving effort because we're not going to wait until we have all the answers figured out before we embark on this. We're really going to just jump right in and kind of um, fashion it as we go. Uh, but it's, it's been years in the making, and the, the good news is we finally figured out you know, that this is, this is fundamentally something that is, in fact, structural, that there is a dedicated career um, for it, for many of our folks, there's, um, there's you know, enough of a career there and enough of a discipline there that we can, we can call it as such and manage it as such. So the, I think what we're trying to figure out, though, too, is what does the enterprise do? So we're focused, first and foremost, on DIA, but clearly the enterprise as a whole, whether it's the services, the broader commands, um, what have you, they're going to have a role as well, and that's going to be kind of the next step that we're going to have to define is how do we leverage the enterprise when it comes to OSINT and figure out who really can do what and who brings what comparative advantage to the problem set and figure out how to knit it together. So it's, it's going to be a continued effort even after we open the center. Could I add to that, sir? I think um, uh, one of the great applications of machine learning and AI is in this realm. It's not about necessarily finding meaning in these large volumes of data. It is doing attribution of that data. And um, can we use AI and machine learning to help discern uh, is the person uh, behind that particular bot or post or whatever um, tied to US persons? And um, I think there's great opportunity there for AI and machine learning. Yeah, I'd agree. The vetting premium is huge here. I uh, can't say enough about OSINT as actually a form of early warning, especially in, uh, in theaters where we just don't have sufficient collection. Uh, the speed is unmatched. And so you really need that vetting behind that particular one-liner to find out if this is a early warning that we need to pursue or an early warning we need to ignore. All right, um, in the intelligence community's assessment, to what extent will China dominate 5G communications? How prepared is the U.S. government to protect both uh, government and commercial 5G networks from foreign threats? Can you, can you jump on that one? Yeah, so if, if I can take it, I don't know that I can speak for the broader intelligence okay. community. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, they, they have, it's one of their national priorities, so they have put a lot of effort and resource behind wanting to dominate in the 5G arena. Um, I'd say technologically, I don't think that they're yet, there yet, so it's not a foregone conclusion, and we will continue to have to, to stay after it. Um, but this is an area we, we in the department are, are spending a, a good amount of time on and, and working with the, the intelligence community as well. First off, just to make sure that folks understand the security risks of it, whether it's our, and, and, and our foreign partners, whether it's our European or Middle East or other Asian partners, is. There is a clear, it may, it may be a great package deal today, financing tied up with the bow, um, 
but you need to look long term at the security risks. And you know, the onus I think is on us in the department to also articulate what the military and security implications are of relying on a Chinese or Huawei built 5G telecommunications architecture. And for starters, you have a China national intelligence law that mandates that um, that 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 companies and individuals you know, compel them to to cooperate with the Chinese government. Uh, but, but on the military impact side, whether it's intelligence sharing or mobility, um, there are a tremendous amount of military areas that would be effective, affected when we do not have trusted uh, telecommunications capabilities with, with our close partners. Um, and it's been a challenge working this um, with our allies and partners for them to see um, beyond some of the near-term economic benefits, but to look at those longer-term security risks and getting the intel and defense national security folks to then talk to the commerce uh, 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 business community and hop those stovepipes. Um, we are working uh, in the department within uh, our research and engineering group, so uh, Dr. Griffin and Dr. Porter are leading an effort to um, create a, uh, an integration test bed. So. Uh, whether you're U.S. or other companies, and I would note there are there are other companies out there that are probably leading um, beyond the U. The U.S. does not have an end-to-end -end solution, but they're working on developing an integrated test bed so that uh, companies can come and uh, and test out and evolve their technology and work the integration pieces of it so that there are viable alternatives to a Chinese 5G system. Okay, we'll start on your end, Trey. I think you touched on this a little bit already. What keeps you up at night? Anything else? I'm, I'm looking for the black swans. I'm looking for the things that we go. It's Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Oops, it was. Yes, sir. It keeps no, you I, awake. I'm going to be honest with you. Very few enemies or adversaries keep me awake. The, uh, it's more the knowledge of ourselves and our readiness of our, own, of our own systems, ensuring that we're not missing something, missing the big story putting the pieces together, a lot of the things that we've already talked about today, that's what keeps me awake. Jeff? Um, I, I would absolutely say the same thing. There's no adversary or potential adversary that keeps me up at night. Um, uh, it is about our ability to sustain over time a long-term disciplined approach for the various problem sets that are out there. How do we address the urgent needs and the important needs concurrently, and can we maintain that? So that's, that's probably what keeps me up at night. Your black swan question is a little bit different in my mind. Uh, for me, that is about um, an area where there's potential for escalation that we have not been through that escalation cycle previously and know how to handle. So. Um, India-Pakistan border, um, uh, India-China border, they've worked through those issues uh, methodically over time. There's historical precedent in some of those areas, uh, but things continue to change. And um, those are the ones that I would say are worth watching to ensure we um, understand where we're going and are providing best advice and assistance to friends and allies alike around the globe to work through those issues. So I think for me, it's um, the risk that we assume every time we have to make a trade-off decision. Um, so clearly, we, you know, we have many more demands that we can never meet by way of requirements, and our resources just won't keep up regardless. So we are um, almost on a daily basis having to make some choices, and obviously there's risk in every choice that we make. Um, and we can communicate that risk all we want, but um, you know, just worried that something's gonna result as a result of our decisions, and that risk is either not gonna be appreciated or we're not gonna be able to respond. You know, we have a tremendous community out there across defense and national intelligence, folks that are working 24-7, 365 days a year, so I don't know that there's anything specifically that keeps me up at night. I actually would echo kind of what Trey was saying, and I remember he and I just thinking um, over the last couple of days, he and I were on a phone call last Friday, and we were asking ourselves, "Hey, have we made? Have we? Do we have the policy in place um, so that the folks that need to take action, you know, whether over the weekend or on a holiday, you know, that they they have the authorities, they have the policy, they have the guidance to do what they need to do, um, and and it's making sure we've 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 thought through those, and that that we, you know, I'm. Uh, policy weenie up in OSD, but making sure that we provided that frame and that, that guidance to them so that they can go off and do what they do best. Okay, I'm coming down the line now. We'll give you one last chance to talk to industry. 
What are your top one, two, three priorities? What do you think industry could do to help? Start with Karen. Helping us modernize our very manual, labor-intensive, linear processes. And the more I see, the more I uncover in this community, there are a lot of them that we've just fine-tuned and, and are bespoke that we need help on. Um, so that, I'd say, uh, uh, helping us evolve in areas like AI, MAVEN, MARS, getting those scaled, um, uh, getting them out to the field. Uh, and then I would be remiss if I also didn't talk the security pieces. Uh, you know, with a China and a Russia who are intent on getting after our technology and our intellectual property and our people, we have to protect that. We have to make sure that we have a trusted workforce and we'll need industry's help in all those areas. So I'll emphasize supply chain one more time. Um, but then obviously with Mars, and Mars is just the, the best example to date we have of working with industry and asking industry to challenge our assumptions on what we think we need um, to help us really think through and think a little more creatively about what we need. Um, and that obviously takes some understanding and, and constant engagement to, to kind of live in our shoes a little bit so that, uh, so that you can in fact do that. But I do worry that you know, we all kind of fall into that trap of just presuming we know what we need and then asking you to deliver it. We have to flip that and you have to challenge us on that a little bit more. Uh, data interoperability um, and standards, uh, you know, the older models of proprietary data standards um, served us well for a period of time, and I think we're just past that, and we're moving past that. The business model of the future is about integrating and understanding data, uh, and the more we partner with industry. Uh, and then collaborative development. Um, if we ever do solve the Agile um, acquisition kinds of things. It means partnering with industry from the very beginning of what are we trying to do, how do we do it, how do we fail together, and then how do we deliver some set, subset of what we started. Um, there's a business model somewhere in there. Industry does it well. Uh, there's a path for the government in there uh, and partnering with us to help design that and making Congress comfortable with that sort of strategy. We're the functional managers for three disciplines, warning, collection management, and targeting. We haven't talked too much about targeting, but I'm gonna offer th uh, three things in that order. In warning, just helping us not sacrifice accuracy and thoroughness, completeness for speed. In collection management, we need, to help, we need some help automating the process. Our automation for collection management is dated. And then in targeting, we always need help, and this will be the case from now until eternity. Just helping distinguish enemy from non-enemy is one of the hardest things we do in the business. Okay, we're going to stop there. I ask you to give uh, the panel a round of applause for spending some time with us. <laughs> Ho hopefully we didn't give too many jump balls, and thank you all very much. And uh, that will... Chuck, oh no, not Chuck. Okay, uh, thank you General Stewart and all our panelists for that thought-provoking conversation. One more round of applause. Uh, I'm Bob Noonan. I'm the chair of the Intel Committee at AFC, and now it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Joe Schmank to the stage, and he's going to introduce the winners of the Epic App Challenge. Joe is an INSA member, a member of the AFC Intelligence Committee, Chief Mission Officer Intelligence at Microsoft Azure Government Cloud, and all-around good guy. So, um, Joe, welcome. Thanks, Bob. I, I don't know about that last comment, but everything else is true. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here in Microsoft uh, representing our Azure Government Cloud program. Uh, I'm working with the EPIC uh, Committee uh, as part of the AFSIA Intelligence Committee to make this challenge a reality. The challenge was given to a number of teams, uh, and their effort was to extract open source news information. Um, enhance it visually and build a triage model and informing those who need to know about the, the information. Very much like what the uh, panel just was talking about. Um, the teams uh, were assessed earlier today with a, a panel of judges including myself and it's now my honor uh, to represent the announce the winners. Um, we had uh, a number of entries. I'm going to announce an honorable mention and then three winners and then the the, the last winner, I'll ask that team to come to the stage for 
receipt of a lar very large check somewhere over there and uh, take a picture. So without further ado, uh, the honorable mention was a, a company called Sourced, and Sourced built a tool uh, that helps snip information from the internet and keep the sourcing of that information along with it as it made its way to the consumers. So a very, very uh, clever uh, idea. Um, on third place, we had uh, congratulations to Source. In third place, we had a team from LMI. Um, and LMI will win $1,000. LMI built a, uh, a new sentiment analysis prototype. And you know, uh, like these things happen, they were notified two weeks uh, ago. They had the opportunity for two weeks and, and did a really nice job. So congratulations to LMI. In the second place, we have a $2,000 award given to Stabilitas. And Stabilitas built a product for risk assessment and then alerting based on news and uh, geography of where that information has occurred. So very, very topical for today. Um, so congratulations to Stabilitas. And last but not least, uh, $3,000 goes to a team from New Wave Solutions. Congratulations, New Wave. Please come to the stage. Hopefully they're here. I saw them out in the front. Yeah, there we go. Um, New Wave built a, uh, a, you know, again, a small team of five people for a couple of weeks, built a very, very tailored tool, um, taking news and Twitter information, munging it together and analyzing it. Um, very, very focused on the problem set for military analysts. So very, very tailored to this customer set. So fantastic job, New Wave. Congratulations. And they said they'll use the check to buy anybody a drink right afterwards. That's not true. That's not true. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, another round of applause. These are great competitors here. Okay, we've lost a lot of people, but in closing tomorrow, we'll reconvene again at 8.30 a.m. for our Challenges and Opportunities in Space plenary session. This concludes day one. Enjoy the reception that is sponsored by Raytheon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>